So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Postgres BDR and distributed architectures. Uh, this was billed as uh, BDR from the perspective of, of a QA engineer, uh, and we did have a QA engineer working on this, and um, uh, the kind of shape of the presentation is, is what came out of that original proposal. Uh, so I've sort of taken over the, the speaking slot. But by taking it over, I've also kind of done it my way as well. So hopefully I'm saying uh, the, you know, some of the things that would have been said. So, uh, so I'm going to have a look at uh, various distributed system architectures, uh, how they work, uh, and uh, sort of comparing and contrasting the type of bugs that you get uh, in, in each. Uh, and then I'm going to go into more detail about the BDR system itself uh, and so, you know, sort of uh, some of the ways that that works as well. So, so let's start off by talking about my favourite product, um, <clears throat> MongoDB. Uh, I mean, look, you know, it's a joke and it doesn't really matter uh, what the name of the system I here is. But uh, here we've got a distributed uh, system uh, where it's sort of multiple nodes. So each of the, uh, the blue nodes is a, is a separate uh, operating system image. Uh, and we've got a, a scalable, horizontally scalable uh, DBMS that's able to service very large scalable workloads. Uh, now, in this particular case, the architecture is uh, that there's an intelligent client uh, that uh, understands the distribution of data. And so when the client wishes to make a request, it's able to go directly to the partition containing uh, the data. So it's actually a coordinator-less architecture. Okay? Uh, and that means the path length between the user application and the data is minimized. Okay? So we're going directly to the data, and we're accessing the data, and then we're coming back. Now, that gives um, uh, a, a, a difference between that and other uh, architectures which are more suitable for uh, decision support. Uh, the original Teradata architecture was copied by Parexcel and Greenplum, and that's an architecture where instead of with this system, uh, the distributed system is accessible directly by the user. In this situation, you make a connection to what looks like a single unified DBMS, and then that DBMS does some clever stuff underneath the covers. So in this case, all of these uh, servers here are working together and they're all in the same rack um, so they're all able to communicate swiftly together. Now in this system where it's more designed for a business intelligence situation uh, we're going to break down uh, a query into multiple pieces, send out those pieces to a number of nodes and they uh, those nodes each process their own set of data bring a result set back uh, to the coordinator node, uh, and then we return to the user. Okay. So uh, a couple of comments uh, there is the path length uh, from the user through to the data and back again is a double hop. Okay. Um, and you can see that that type of architecture works very nicely for large set-based queries where we've got a large amount of data spread out across partitions, but it doesn't work as well when we're looking at um, OLTP short queries because w uh, whereas uh, previously we only had one network call, now we've got two uh, or, or uh, two network hops, which obviously, uh, when you return that way, means you've got quite a few different network hops involved. Okay. Now, um, because Mason's just walked into the room, uh, I'll comment on how similar this is to the Excel architecture. Now, in Excel, uh, we've got a thing called a uh, distributed uh, or a global transaction coordinator. Uh, which is actually a, a third node over here. Uh, and actually, currently, OLTP requests in an Excel architecture require three network hops. 
Okay, uh, and that's one of the things that we're uh, looking to optimise is to reduce the number of network hops required to do certain types of query. Okay. So, uh, for those of you that were in my talk about scalability, I was talking about theoretical scalability and the overheads involved. And as the overhead um, uh, of uh, the non parallelizable overhead increases, uh, that's alpha, uh, you get a drop in scalability. So, basically, if the query is uh, exactly and fully theoretically scalable, uh, then you can get linear linear scalability, i.e., you add nodes, you get more performance. Okay, if the overhead is is higher, uh, then you add nodes and nothing happens. Okay, so that's a bad thing. So uh, one of the things I was looking at for uh, the the future of Postgres horizontal. Uh, scalability was to backtrack uh, uh, on how many network hops are required uh, and actually make uh, what I call a peer architecture where uh, a user can connect to any of the nodes in the system and then that node acts as both a coordinator and a data node. Okay. Now one of the, the other reasons for doing that is in the uh, the Green Plum and Par Excel world, this node is where uh, the parser uh, and uh, the optimizer and the top of the executor comes in. Whereas on on these nodes, all they have is the guts of the executor. And now, you know what the hell am I talking about, right? What does that mean in real world terms? Okay, what it means is on Green Plum, you can't write a function which has embedded SQL in it. So you can't write a function that executes SQL. You can write a function that does some clever calculation, but it can't write SQL. Okay? Why? Because by the time the executor is executing the function, you've missed the bit where you can execute more SQL. So uh, it's not possible to have re-entrant SQL. And <clears throat> now if you're thinking, Hell, I don't use re-entrant SQL. Well, you do. You probably just don't realize it because there's a ton of little tools and applications, all of which are busy executing bits of SQL for you, and that happens like all the time. Okay, so it's it's a bit annoying when you port an application to uh, Par Excel or Greenplum uh, that it basically doesn't work fully in the way that you want it to work. Okay, so I'm not trying to diss those systems. I'm just trying to explain that uh, there are restrictions that exist, and for the future, we'd like to try to get rid of those restrictions if possible. Okay, I'm sure there's a reason why somebody's going to come up with some reasons why it's not possible, but we'll see. So, anyway, so I haven't yet talked uh, about BDR, which uh, you know we're kind of like 15 minutes into the talk. Uh, when am I going to do that? So uh, that's where I, I draw a, uh, an even busier diagram uh, of a distributed system. Now, uh, the green boxes previously were the users. Um, and we had this kind of inherent assumption that all of the users were kind of coming out of some uh, application server. And all of the data nodes were all in one rack in one data center, okay? which is just a wonderful uh, assumption uh, just as long as it's true. Now, um, in, in that situation, we were concentrating on uh, reducing query overhead. We were trying to reduce the database portion uh, of the execution time. Now, this BDR and geographically distributed databases have a completely different objective. Here, we have users spread out potentially across the whole world, and those users want to experience as low a latency to the database as possible. So in order to do that, what we do is we take potentially many different copies of the database, and we put that database as near to them as possible. Okay? So uh, applications I've seen 
uh, have uh, things like user control systems where you're able to set your preferences. Okay? Now, the, when a guy in Australia connects to the system, he wants snappy response time and he sets his preferences. When a guy in London uh, does it, uh, or a guy in Texas, again, they all want snappy response times and uh, unfortunately, it's 480 milliseconds round trip to Australia. Uh, so if you were looking for a, a 10 millisecond response time on your query, you're definitely not going to get it, no matter how fast the database. And the database would need to go back in time in order to deliver a, a query that quick. Okay? So the purpose here is to minimize the network bandwidth, not or um, to minimize the network overhead, not to minimize the database overhead. Okay? So here we have people accessing their local copy of the database. And this isn't just hot standby, this is fully writable copies of the data. Okay? Now in this situation, you make the changes to your local copy of the database and then those changes are propagated through to the other write nodes in the, in the geographically distributed cluster. Okay? So these things are not like in the same rack. Okay? They're not all in some data center in San Antonio. They are spread out across the whole world. Okay? Um, and <clears throat> at this point, some people go, well, look, why would I ever want that? And then we will sit down and go, right, so imagine that you've got, say, a website that's got users that are all over the world, and then you think about it, and actually it's like, well, actually, that's almost all websites uh, could potentially have this problem. The only reason they don't is that quite a few applications are designed with a local uh, area in mind in that uh, the, peop the way people tend to think is I'll set up a business that's addressing uh, you know, the needs of Texas or the needs of Europe or the needs of Australia and people don't tend to think in terms of global applications. But there are quite a few businesses out there that do literally uh, address the whole world in terms of their user population. Um, okay, so where does BDR come in? Uh, well, we, I, I, we said that we would also talk about the, the Translattice Elastic Database, uh, and that was one of the things that, uh, that was worked on originally. So, um, kind of um, apologies, really, because um, Translattice has actually now uh, gone under, or whatever the, the word is for, <coughs> for not being here anymore. Um, but uh, just really wanted to compare the, the two approaches uh, that were used in the, in the databases. So, so TED and BDR were both geographically distributed systems. Okay? Uh, now, uh, BDR was designed from scratch, uh, whereas, Postgres, whereas TED was uh, an, an iteration on some earlier work called uh, Postgres R, which was actually a, a research prototype of how to produce consistent uh, distributed databases uh, in the, uh, the early uh, 2000 um, era. Um, and the model used by TED was uh, eager consistency. So when a transaction went to commit, what it would do, it, was, it, it would take the list of changes that it was making in that transaction and it would share that with all of the other nodes in the cluster and it would get a viewpoint on whether that transaction could be committed and then if it was able to be, yeah, uh, exactly, then that's why it came to very poor performance. Um, and uh, what, what ended up was even after quite considerable tuning, uh, that way of doing things was really uh, quite a, 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 a full overhead way of doing it. In the original Postgres R system, every statement gave a list of changes to the other nodes, uh, and that was after some tuning modified to, uh, to be just uh, at commit time. But even that was a, was a very uh, high overhead way of doing things. 
Now, separately to that, uh, the BDR project started, and, and at the time, we didn't actually know about each other. It's not like we deliberately decided to take uh, an independent viewpoint. We were just working independently for uh, basically the first six to nine months. Uh, now, the requirements here were driven uh, by a particular user group, and they were absolutely certain that they didn't want to do uh, the um, sort of consensus at commit time. They wanted to uh, assume optimistically that there would be no conflicts. And the reason for that was that the target application was what I'd said before, a user... Um, a user preferences application, and because of the nature of the application, a user was only ever in one place at one time. So you would never get the same user log on to both London and Australia at the same time. So the likelihood of conflicts was essentially zero. Okay, and so because because the use case had zero conflicts, uh, it obviously made sense to have an optimistic model where we would just commit locally, and then if there's going to be a problem, we'll kind of sort it out later, okay? Now, <coughs> uh, the, the sort it out later uh, bit obviously does give a problem. They're called conflicts, okay? That's a bad thing, okay? If you have an application that has inherently conflicts within it, then this really won't work for you, okay? It wouldn't work with TED, and it won't work with BDR. Okay, because if you're updating the same thing in two places at the same time, uh, the very best thing that can happen is it's going to work slowly. You imagine what's going to happen if we had a one uh, a database with one row in it and it's being updated in multiple places. Okay, performance is going to suck. Okay, um, now. Uh, so, you know, at this point you're sort of saying, right, so what you're saying is your database sucks and therefore I won't use yours, I'll use somebody else's. Well, what, what I'm saying is that if you take an Oracle rack system and you've got one, no, one row in it and you try to update that one row on multiple nodes, the whole thing will go slower than if you'd just had one node, okay? because it's just physics. You can't update the same thing in, in different places at the same time and have it go, it won't even go at the same speed. It's definitely gonna go slower, okay? So if you've got a system or, or an application with uh, uh, anything other than a low to zero conflict ratio, then it's not gonna work, okay? So if you're just generally randomly updating data in all these nodes all across the world, then you're going to get a lot of conflicts. It's not going to work, okay? So um, I don't want to kind of uh, say that too softly. Eh? You, you need to say it so that you understand that, you know, if you've got conflicts, it's going to suck. If you've got no conflicts, it's going to work quite nicely, okay? And it's quite distinct, yeah? Right, <coughs> so... Uh, BDR as a project, uh, designed originally in 2009, uh, we kicked it off in 2011. Uh, the uh, demonstration uh, performance prototype was demonstrated uh, at PGCon in 2012, uh, and then professional development continued uh, for uh, further time. Uh, so we delivered that in full uh, about two and a half years later. Um, and it's um, uh, we're, we're basically still working on the, the contributions. Um, so there were contributions from the project in 9.3, 9.4, 9.5, and we're expecting to uh, further uh, contribute the outputs of the project into core Postgres. So uh, the current situation is that BDR uh, is available now, fully open source, uh, marked as a contribution to the Postgres project. Uh, it uh, requires a patched version of Postgres 9.4. Okay? There isn't currently, nor are we planning there to be, a 9.5 version of it, uh, but that's something to discuss uh, later. So it requires a patched 
version of Postgres 9.4. Okay, it's not an extension, it's a patch that goes over the top and you need to recompile it. We do provide binaries for, uh, for you, uh, but they are different binaries to the, uh, the core Postgres PGDG ones. Okay? Um, now this is not a situation that we enjoy. Uh, what we have done is uh, already we've contributed about 60% of the code uh, back into Postgres 9.4. That went up even more. We got uh, about 80% of the code into 9.5 uh, and, and then there's some remaining uh, parts that, that we need to, uh, to get in. So, but uh, now obviously the reason I'm telling you this is that it relates to uh, the robustness of the code and, and whether it's usable in production. So basically, most of the code is already in Postgres and it's uh, you know pretty bug free. So you know we're already doing quite a, uh, a good job along those lines. So uh, where are we exactly? Uh, we've got to release um, BDR uh, 0.9.3. Um, some people say they're not going to use it because it doesn't have the magic 1.0 uh, naming uh, and that's a good thing. So if a number scares you, uh, I'm very happy you're not using the software. Okay? Uh, we will renumber it for the people that need to show their boss that it's at least 1.0 before it's usable. Um, but frankly, what we've wanted to do is make sure we got the software right before a million people attempt to use it. Okay, uh, which seems fair enough. Um, so uh, I can tell you that we've got businesses that have been in production for more than 12 months uh, using uh, BDR. Um, have they had bugs? Yes, they've had bugs. Okay, we fixed the bugs. And uh, so it's had professional formal testing uh, over that time. Uh, we've got diagnostic tools and techniques. Uh, that have been developed based upon diagnosing production failures uh, and at, at this point I can say uh, that it's battle hardened uh, and we, we have referenceable uh, deployments uh, to, to demonstrate its capabilities. Okay? Um, and I, uh, I bumped into uh, the guys from Consistent State uh, and they said that they'd actually deployed it for one of their customers and they'd never found a bug. Uh, that was their words. Um, so, uh, you know, they could have taken me into a corner and given me a beating, uh, but they didn't. They, uh, they, they said that, uh, that it, was, it was usable in production and they'd not had any bugs. So, so uh, how exactly does it work? Um, what I wanted to do is just go through uh, uh, the, uh, a comparison between physical and logical replication. So physical replication, uh, we have um, uh, the write ahead log or transaction log is sent from the WAL sender to the WAL receiver uh, and uh, saved again uh, in the directory on the standby. And then it's read from there by the startup process that applies the physical changes to the database blocks and then they are saved to the database. Okay? So uh, this is known as uh, streaming replication, uh, whereas I'm now beginning to call it physical streaming replication to, uh, to denote the fact that the changes that are being transferred are changes to physical data blocks um, and it's basically an exact copy of the database. Now it's that, uh, that uh, architecture, that mechanism of doing things uh, that we need to change in order to enhance things. So we had a choice of whether we continued to enhance hot standby and add features to it, or the, whether we made an architectural leap forwards to a different way of doing things that's basically got more distance uh, for future development. So what uh, we did was take the same basic plumbing and uh, use uh, that for a, a similar workflow. Here, uh, 
the user's changes get written to the transaction log, uh, to the WAL files, and then the WAL sender uh, gets called, uh, and here we execute something called uh, a logical decoding output plugin. <sighs> Whoever thought of that name? Um, but this plugin uh, uses uh, a transactional API that allows it to read the logical changes made by a particular transaction. So it reads the transactions in commit order. So when a transaction commits, all of the changes made by that transaction are available all at once to the output plugin. If the transaction aborts, it never gets seen at all. Okay? And all things like vacuums, uh, updates of indexes, locking records are all filtered away. So the only data that you see in the plugin is the actual data changes themselves. Okay? Now what happens here is we do the decoding and then this plugin is designed to send the data across libpq using the same uh, mechanism um, as we do for streaming rep. Uh, through to uh, an apply process which is written as a background worker uh, that runs within another master. So whereas before this is a master and this is a standby, here uh, we have an upstream and a downstream master. Uh, this apply process then writes that to the database. Now the, the, the exact mechanisms for this are slightly different between 9.4 and 9.5 uh, and actually now uh, this process is even more efficient in 9.5 than it was previously. Okay, so, so what we have here is one-way replication. So how do we get from one-way replication to bi-directional replication? Well, yes, it is that obvious. We just have one going in either direction, okay? Uh, and so if we've got three nodes in a bi-directional replication setup, then we actually have six connections because each node is connected to every other node twice. Okay, So three nodes gives us six connections. Uh, now, when we talk about are there limits on the number of nodes that we can get in a BDR cluster, just in practical terms, uh, obviously if you go up to uh, 100 nodes, then you're going to have quite a considerable number of connections because you've got to have connections in both directions for each uh, of the other nodes in the cluster. So you can see you're going to get 198 connections per node when you get to 100, which is kind of like about the kind of the worst case limit. But realistically, uh, 100 nodes is way too many. I can't really see why you'd need that many. Uh, we can see various use cases where you'd need quite a few, but you know, but, but quite often not that many. Anyway, um, so that gives us uh, the opportunity for multiple deliverables. So the original and basic uh, uh, thing that we've built is BDR, is a multi-master distributed database and uh, that is based on Postgres 9.4, now at version 0.9.3, fully available now. Um, and that is with data passing in both directions. Now because what we produced here is pretty damn cool just of itself, uh, we've got another couple of deliverables which we've called UDR or unidirectional replication. Now this is a much simpler form of the same code. The purpose here is to produce something that does not require a patched Postgres. We want to deliver something that's usable by you know, normal typical Postgres users. Uh, so this code footprint works more easily with Postgres, but it's also got uh, a kind of wider range of use cases. Uh, notably, this does not provide multi-master. Okay? You need that 
to do multi-master. But that's okay, because there's a hell of a lot of useful things that you can do, even if you don't have multi-master. Okay? Uh, and specifically, we've got uh, data replication. If you're using something like Sloney or Londeast or, uh, well, I'll, I'll say Bocado, but uh, Bocado's mostly thought of as a multi-master situation. But if you're using Sloney or Londeast for transmitting data uh, between applications, uh, application integration type of thinking, uh, then you can use this uh, for that. This allows you to do selective replication. So you can select particular databases, you can select particular sets of tables, um, uh, and eventually in the future you'll be able to filter the rows uh, that happen between tables. One of the features that we've got at the moment, for example, is you can uh, filter inserts, but not deletes. And so that what that allows you to do is have a small, tight OLTP database passing data through to a much uh, deeper historical data warehouse style database. So all the inserts come, go through and all the deletes are blocked. Okay. Uh, now that is available now as an extension uh, with Postgres 9.4 uh, and it also provides zero downtime upgrade. Now the reason you haven't heard about this is that you, you can upgrade from 9.4 to something. Okay. Well at the moment there isn't anything that you can update, upgrade to. So when 9.5 comes out you will be able to upgrade from 9.4 to 9.5 using this. Okay. Now, because of the changes in Postgres 9.5 are quite extensive, what we are doing is we're actually redesigning this UDR thing and we're calling it PG Logical. Now, the reason for the name change and the redesign is actually the code base here is, is, is forking. Okay. Now the reason for the fork is that we've got a lot of changes now into Postgres 9.5 that weren't in 9.4 and the emphasis that we're, we're making here is that we're producing uh, a tool that's effectively a Londeast replacement. Okay? So we're working on the much wider general case first and then we're going to go back and do BDR later. Okay? Um, so that's not to say that BDR is no good or it doesn't work or no one needs it, but it is a restricted use case in comparison with the much wider use case of replication. Okay. So uh, PG Logical will be coming out uh, uh, here in the future. It's got a number of internal uh, developments that make it much better than UDR. Um, and uh, it's got a much more flexible protocol and such like that. So uh, guys are working on it at the minute. Uh, it's uh, going to be available towards the end of the year when 9.5 comes out. And specifically, zero downtime upgrade It's going to be designed to upgrade your systems from 9.4 to 9.5. OK? So. Um, it is, PG Logical is an extension, okay? Which means you can install it on top of 9.5. Now, what's happening about sticking it in core? Well, our first concern is to get something that works for users, okay? Um, the way we figure is there's more users than there are developers, so we should please the users first and then please the developers. Okay? So <coughs> in terms of uh, the extension, the extension will be released round about the time that 9.5 uh, is released, and uh, then uh, all of that code is going to be submitted to 9.6, uh, and with the best luck, in the world, uh, we hope that it will be accepted uh, into core Postgres. Okay, uh, it will be completely full function. The thing that's submitted to core, we're not holding back some enterprise version or anything like that. Okay, we're going to submit the whole thing. 
but it is going to be usable in the 9.5 time frame. You're not going to have to wait another year for it to go into 9.6. Now, there might be some changes in the 9.6 version. Who knows? Um, there might not be, but um, there will be a 9.5 version that you can use. Where does that leave us? Well, at the moment, uh, Multimaster does require a patched version of Postgres, and we're hoping that once we've got the replication mechanism fully into core, it will then be uh, acceptable to submit the changes for Multimaster uh, into uh, core as well. Uh, the big blocker to all of this uh, is actually DDL replication, because all this stuff breaks if it doesn't handle DDL as well. Okay? Now, 9.5 has got a lot of stubs for um, uh, handling uh, DDL, but at the moment, they're stubs that is not full uh, DDL handling. Uh, so, in order for this to be acceptable, we're expecting to have to discuss how is it you will handle DDL changes to those tables and you know it's going to be a long discussion and it ain't pretty um, so it's uh, it's going to be a long discussion so um, but the objective here uh, so it is to go way beyond what Sloney and Londist achieved uh, which was they achieved data movement and what we're looking to achieve is data movement plus DDL handling Okay, so it's actually a significant uh, sort of increment onwards in terms of uh, design and usability. So, so that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, I'm sure it will uh, all work as planned. So, um, so in terms of sort of QA, um, all of this stuff has been formally QA'd. Uh, the, uh, the PG logical extension um, is at the point where we're just beginning to test that now uh, based upon the internal, uh, the recent internal redesigns that have happened over the last couple of months. So given that 9.5 is due out in December, then we're kind of roughly going to deliver something in that time frame. Okay. So uh, obviously that will be formally announced, etc. Um, if, it, if it goes to plan, there'll be like a PG logical beta and then a PG logical production version later as well. Okay. Um, uh, unfortunately, none of the development team are here. Um, I'm sort of overseeing the development and discussing the architecture, uh, but I'm not writing much of the code at, at this point. Uh, but there are some things that I need to uh, to write as well. So if you're going to uh, the European conference, uh, we're actually going to have uh, one of the developers uh, there to talk about some of the things that are happening. Um, um, but they're, they're not here to discuss that in more detail. So, um, cool. 10 out of 10. Um, so uh, that is, uh, is what I had to talk about. So if you've got any questions, uh, I'd like to field those now. What does it mean? Uh, How will that work? Like, what are the criteria for conflict Right. Uh, so the basic uh, conflict uh, resolution mechanism is we're using something called last update wins. Uh, there's a module called commit timestamp been included into 9.5. Uh, so what we do is we record the timestamp associated with each commit. And when um, we make the changes on one node, we pass the changes to the other node. Uh, and then when we go to update uh, the node, what, when we update a row, we actually look at the row, look at the transaction, uh, and, then c and then just double check that the timestamp is old. If the timestamp is actually quite recent, we uh, check the uh, commit uh, timestamp <coughs> Uh, cache to allow us to decide which update was later and then that one wins. Okay? 
there is uh, a configurable conflict handler as well, so you can program it to work differently according to your needs uh, if you choose. Uh, but, it, it, but it is post-commit uh, transaction change. Um, does that answer your question? Cool. Thank you. Uh, sorry, somebody else was... Yeah. Uh, yep, yeah, in, in, there is an initial copy followed by sort of a catch-up phase that is exactly analogous uh, between the physical and logical worlds. Uh, the initial copy in this situation can be achieved either with a base backup or it can be achieved with a PG dump. Um, and the PG dump uses an exported snapshot to get a consistent copy of the data, which we then use to catch up with. Uh, so, so you can use uh, either a logical dump, PG dump, or a physical base backup, and they both work. Okay. So. And once we're, once we're in sync, that's when we do PG upgrade on the new slave. It's now running at the same version, taking it up to, let's say, 995. Yeah. The changes are still being queued on the master. And then we go ahead and open the, the stream again, and we're... Yep, that's basically it. Yeah, so, so if we were doing an upgrade, this would be 9.4, this would be 9.5. We're streaming it all across. When they're completely caught up and in sync, we can just turn off the 9.4 and we'll progress happily with the 9.5. So, so the idea is uh, zero downtime. Uh, obviously, the whole process of copy and catch up may take hours, uh, but eventually when we're down to... Um, uh, a sort of difference of like milliseconds between the two systems. That's where we uh, block one uh, and then switch across. And so hopefully we'll have been down for like a few seconds, uh, which which is hopefully acceptable. So. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the PG Logical or the UDR that we've got at the minute doesn't handle DDL, okay? So it, when you're doing the zero downtime upgrade, you're basically putting a DDL freeze on uh, those parts of the application. Now, that's a uh, DDL freeze in terms of the main schema. Uh, you know, if, you've, if you're using temp, uh, t like permanent tables as temp tables, you know, that's fine, that's not going to affect this. It doesn't make it break or anything. I'm just saying that, it, you, obviously, if you're in the middle of trying to catch up and you want to do an alter table on one of your main production tables, then it is not going to work, you know? So, and uh, there's no, you know, we're kind of back to physics there. It's like never going to work either. So, you know, we can, the ultimate aim of the DDL handling is is to, make it uh, uh, low cost of ownership for maintenance because one of the nice things that we got from streaming your application is you basically set it and forget it. You don't have to like, with Sloney, you have to, every time you create a table, you have to kind of tickle the database to tell it that you've added a table, you know, so. Yeah. So doing pull a fresh copy. Is there a way to work around that using PG dump or something on that single table to pick up the screen from? Uh, yeah, probably, but it's going to be complex. And if I said it was easy, I'd probably be lying. So. Sure. No, uh, I, I think this is awesome. Those are all some of the things that we still have to consider. I think yeah. Out, so. Yeah, sure. It's okay. With the zero time upgrade, how do you how are you handling global objects like users? Um, well, basically, we're not. Um, so, you know, if, uh, they're not replicated. Um, so if you've got a bunch of users here and you want the same bunch of users here, then you'd need to uh, do a sort of uh, dump all 
uh, of the globals and then uh, apply them over here. So that the setup of this system is, you know, it's a different system. It's it's not necessarily magically, you know, no no touch. You know, you need to think about it to set that system up. But it's, you know, in terms of um, the process of uh, you know, setting this up, it's 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 going to be a, a couple of lines of commands to to get it to do that. Assuming you want the whole of everything, um, but it is one database at a time. It's not all databases. Um, yep. Oh no. Well, I mean, it depends how the federated database works. Uh, do, do you mean sort of uh, like a connection to Oracle, or, or, or do you mean a, a sharded federation? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, uh, it depends, I think. You know, there's bits of it that will work and bits of it that won't, but I would expect it to. Let's assume it won't work. I'll just say it won't work. Uh, and then, it, you know, uh, and then I'm not lying. So, um, but uh, you know, th there's probably some bits that can be usefully uh, made to usefully work. So, any other questions? Come on, Magnus, ask a question. Like India, like DDR, where you have like multiple masters in different geographies. Yeah. Um, well, we use timestamp with time zone, so we we're effectively doing a, a UTC comparison between the timestamps. Um, obviously, if you if you if the time is set incorrectly on the different nodes, then you're going to get a problem. Uh, but there's nothing we can do about that. I mean, if you if you're if you're saying that you want to use time to resolve conflicts and then you don't set the time correctly, it's yeah. going to break, isn't it? So. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, what I was uh, saying to somebody earlier um, was, uh, you know, I really don't want to make you think that this is magic. Uh, it's clever, okay, and it works, but it's more complex. Look, that is. That is a more complex diagram than just two boxes, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, you know, if you're going to if you're going to have a setup like that, it's going to be at least three times more complex than one node. Okay. So, uh, you know, don't don't enter into BDR thinking that it's trivial and that it's just going to work with no thought at all. Uh, no, you know, uh, that's not going to be the case. Okay. Um, okay, thank you very much.